Today's video is going to cover ensembles and boosting. We'll discuss what an ensemble is, and then we'll go into boosting, and we'll specifically cover the AdaBoost algorithm. What is an ensemble? An ensemble is just a group. The most common example of an ensemble would be a band, like a jazz ensemble. It's just a group of jazz musicians. We can create an ensemble of classifiers and use voting to make a final decision. If we build a decision tree many times, we'll get the same tree, so long as the data stays the same. So we don't want an ensemble of the same decision tree. That wouldn't be helpful. There are two ways you can get different classifiers to build an ensemble with. We can build an ensemble by training different classifiers, or we can train a single type of classifier on different data sets. Either way you do it, you'll have many classifiers. F1, F2, F3, all the way to Fm. Remember that each model is a function of input to output. At test time, we'll make M predictions, Y1 hat, Y2 hat, and so on, using each of our machines. Then at the end, we just predict the majority class. So we sum up all the predictions and take the sign. Why do we use ensembles? It's unlikely that all classifiers will make the same mistake. If we're trying to train the same classifier on different data sets, you may be wondering, how do we get different data sets? We're only given one set of training data. Well, we can actually separate the data like we did in cross-validation. What we can do is called bootstrap resampling. It's a sampling with replacement. The following method is called bagging. In bagging, you start with the data set D that contains N training examples. From the single data set, you can create M many bootstrapped training sets. Each of these bootstrapped sets also contains N training examples drawn randomly from D with replacement. You can then train a decision tree or other model separately on each of these data sets to obtain classifiers. Generally, bagging ensemble methods are less likely to be overfit to the data. It's a pretty simple concept. Now let's move on to boosting. Boosting is the process of taking a weak learner W and turning it into a strong learner. The basic idea of boosting is like what you do when you're studying for an exam, like we talked about in the Perceptron. You make a set of note cards and you review them. The next time you review them, you may get some right and some wrong. The ones you get right, you probably don't need to look at as much, so you set them aside. As time goes on, you're focusing only on the terms or samples you're getting wrong, the ones you're struggling with. This is what happens in AdaBoost. AdaBoost stands for Adaptive Boosting Algorithm. I like to present the algorithm first so we can go through it step by step. W is the weak learner. This can be a perceptron, a decision tree, whatever. D is the set of training data. K is the number of times we're going to run AdaBoost in an effort to make the weak learner better. Let's look at line one. We have a set of weights, lowercase d, being defined for the zeroth iteration. So we have d to the zero. d is the set of weights for the training data. Each of the samples starts off with equal weight. Since there are n samples in the training set, each sample gets a weight of 1 over n. Line 2 has our for loop, where we're going to run the boosting k times. Line 3 we're training the weak learner w using the data set d and the set of weights d to the k minus 1. In our first iteration, d to the k minus 1 equals d to the 0, and so all our weights are even. Training w results in a function f to the k, which we can then use to make predictions on samples. All this line is doing is training our weak learner. So we just make some assumption that given all the models and algorithms that we've learned so far, we can actually add weights to every sample as a part of training. This is a very reasonable assumption to make. Line four, 
Now that we have the trained model, we want to make predictions on all of the training data to see how the weak learner did. So we run every sample through the weak learner model to get predictions. Line 5. We calculate the error of the kth weak learner given the weights for each sample. So this is the weighted error using the d to the k minus 1. yn is not equal to y hat n is the indicator function. That's 1 when it's true and 0 otherwise. So the error is simply a weighted count of incorrect predictions. Now we need to compute the adaptive parameter that helps us to calculate the new sample weights. We calculate this as 1 half log of 1 minus e to the k over e to the k. There is an alpha for each iteration of Adaboost, or for each weak learner, however you want to look at it. As long as w gets better than 50% training error, then alpha is going to be greater than 0. We will talk more about alpha when we finish the remaining lines of the algorithm. Now that we have the weight for the weak learner, we need to update the sample weights for the next iteration of the algorithm. This step is similar to when you toss note cards out of the stack because you know them already. We're re-weighting the note cards here. We do this by taking the old weight for the note card, or sample, and multiplying it by an exponential expression involving the classifier weight and the label and the prediction. What is z? z is a normalization to make sure that all the new d to the k sum to 1. We end our for loop, and now we have completed Adaboost and we need to make a prediction on a test sample x hat. We run it through all of our trained classifiers and weight the predictions by our alphas. We take the sign of the sum over all weak learner models to produce a final classification. Why is alpha defined this way? Let's take an aside to talk about logarithms. Remember these useful log identities. Log of m to the n equals n log m, and m to the log base m of n equals n. To better understand why alpha is defined as it is, suppose that our weak learner simply returns a constant function that returns the weighted majority class. So if the total weight of positive examples exceeds that of negative examples, then we predict positive 1. Otherwise, we predict negative 1. To make the problem moderately interesting, suppose that in the original training set there are 80 positive examples and 20 negative examples. In this case, the classifier would predict positive 1. Its weighted error rate would be 0.2 because it gets every negative example wrong. Now we calculate alpha. We would get 1 half log of 4. Before normalization, we get the new weight for each positive or correct example to be 1 over 200. And we get the weight for each negative or incorrect example as 1 over 50. OK, so how do we do that? The log we're referring to here is log base e, or the natural log. So if we use our handy-dandy identities from before, we can reduce and get e to the negative 1 half log of 4 equals 1 half. We can compute z like this, and therefore, after normalization, the weight distribution on any single positive example is going to be 1 over 160. Remember that we multiply by 1 over z and the weight on any negative example is going to be 1 over 40. However, since there are 80 positive examples and 20 negative examples, the cumulative weight on all positive samples is 1 half, and the cumulative weight on all negative samples is also 1 half. Thus, after a single boosting iteration, the data has become precisely evenly weighted. This guarantees that in the next iteration, our weak learner must do something more interesting than majority voting if it is to achieve an error rate less than 50% as required. The next topic is neural networks.